Welcome to Sustainable Kashi's uh, free permaculture class. We're here, we're proud to host these classes in order to share um, with each other and using permaculture as our foundation. Uh, if you have any suggestions for any topics or presenters you'd like to hear from, go ahead and put them in the chat box there and we will track them down and get them on a call. Um, we're located physically in Sebastian, Florida on an 80 acre retreat uh, center. Um, we're right on the St. Sebastian River, so very biodiverse and very beautiful natural location where we have nine demonstration gardens, we have volunteer opportunities, classes and workshops. So make sure you go to uh, sustainablekashi.com if you want to learn more about us here. We really focus on demonstrating uh, these systems and helping you get your hands on to really learn and understand how they work. So we hope you can all come out for a visit sometime really soon. Today we're talking about biodiversity and I'm really excited and it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Jeff Trapani. Uh, Jeff Trapani is the executive director of Orlando Permaculture. He is um, extremely biodiverse and is a beautiful human being that I've had the privilege of uh, working with and teaching alongside of for almost 10 years. So it's really exciting to have you on the call here, Jeff. And without further ado, I'll let you bring us on this a beautiful adventure of biodiversity. All right, thanks, Terry, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm just gonna put my slides up here. I think you guys can all see that. And then also in the chat, I put a file that you can click on and that has resources for you. So after the presentation, if you're like, where did, where did Jeff get this information? There, there's, a, there's several key articles in there that you can click on and you'll be able to view the entire journal article. Um, some of these articles you cannot access online for free. So um, you can thank me later. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get started. Now, in the age of COVID and antibiotic resistance, it's important to educate people about how infections and the immune system actually work. There's so much information out there that you're getting right now in the media, and people are very confused about how to prevent disease and infection. Millions of people die just from mis misinformation. And so my mission right now is to, to shine the light on the microbiome and just show how it can lead to human health or to human disease, a chronic illness, all right, depending on how you treat it. And the biodiversity salad, which I'm going to show you how to make today, is one way to help you on that path to health and reversing many chronic illnesses. So as Terry mentioned, I am the one of the education directors for Orlando Permaculture here in Central Florida. And we help people become more resilient in many areas from food, water, medicine, um, water harvesting, and, and, and many different things. And one of the big things that we do talk about and help people do through our action days and workshops is how to design and implement a food forest garden. And so being able to um, try to mimic the natural ecosystems that are around us and use it in our yards, in our community settings, community spaces to provide an abundance for the community. So scarcity is by design. It's what you see largely around you and abundance can be by design as well. And so you can see my yard before 2014. This is what it looked like, low biodiversity, mostly just dead grass and a few dying uh, citrus trees. And I was able to transform that into an edible medicinal food forest. And it also has a biogas where microbes are breaking down food scraps and making cooking energy. I probably cook a few times every day this summer using gas produced by my microbes. I have a rainwater system that, that um, feeds into my shower uh, on the left there. And on the right, you can barely see it, but I have a compost human earth system. So I'm cycling nutrients and microbes back into the soil. And so uh, the idea that biodiversity and the abundance of microbiology in the soil and plants can bring on a, a healthy ecosystem and using compost with plant matter, uh, worm, worm compost, worm teas, 
all of these different things that we do, including weed teas, where the things that aren't edible medicinal, maybe my Mexican sunflower, I'll put it in water and let it ferment for a few days with, with comfrey and moringa leaves and spread that through the garden. So I'm, I'm putting the microbiology into my food forest, and that's what makes the nutrients available to the plants. That's what makes them healthy. That's what makes them resilient against pathogens and disease. And so with proper biology and proper nutrition, um, many of these regenerative uh, farmers and people who are doing this practice are saying that it can help um, build a very abundant and healthy uh, food production system. And there's many more benefits as well because there's essential oils being released by these trees and flowers that you breathe in um, that can make you healthy. And we'll talk about that. So after five years of designing ecosystems and observing the differences between traditional gardens and food forest gardens, it became clear about what truly creates health. And that's simply put, human health is having a balanced ecosystem between the inside and the outside world. Okay. You can see the biodiversity here in my garden. In, in permaculture, we call it polyculture, many different um, plants together. And then there's also a lot of different microorganisms in the soil. And so it's not just about growing plants, it's about growing homes for all of nature's creatures and the biodiversity of colors and all of the different plant compounds that are, that are tied to those colors and microbes breaking down and making amazing soil. And so the biodiversity is key to health for humans in the ecosystem, all right? A healthy soil microbiome creates healthy, resilient plants. Healthy, diverse populations limit pests and pathogens. There's pests and pathogens that will always be in your garden as well as your body, but it's about limiting them with the good. And all of these mutual beneficial relationships that we have no idea all of the benefits they provide. We just know that we need to do it. And that's why you guys are here. That's why we're learning about creating these ecosystems that mimic the natural world. But what I'm here to talk about today is that you are a walking, talking food forest ecosystem. All right, the plants in your garden, the microbes on the plants, as well as in the air and the soil, the aromatic essential oils that we're breathing in when we walk into a food forest or any forest, by the way. Um, what these can do is they help us become more resilient against stressors in our life, such as toxins and disease. And so as permaculture designers, we can apply many of the permaculture principles to the inner food forest, observing and interacting with how we feel and, and uh, what are the symptoms to any of our illnesses and, and understanding that these are warning signs, just like your car gives a little light that says it needs you to check the engine. Um, your pharmaceutical drugs, all they do for chronic illnesses is they turn off the warning lights. If you stop taking the drug, it's still there. It will remind you that it's still there. And so what we try to do um, is figure out a way to find the root of the problem. And so the symptoms disappear and you're on the path to health. All right, so I'm going to look at the chat and I know there's probably some comments here and, and um, you know, having step to step by guide, step by step guides for building ecosystems and food forests, that that is important, and that's what we do with Orlando Permaculture. And I'm sure through these Kashi talks, we'll be talking about that. So today, I talk about our inner food forest, and um, knowing that we are teeming with microbes inside of our bodies, and it's a big responsibility feeding and protecting trillions of living creatures inside of us, but the payoff is huge, as I will talk about in this talk. And so your microbiome is the collection of all the bacteria that are inside and on top of your body. The microbiota is everything. The microbes, uh, the, the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, the protozoa, and there's just so many. I mean, this absolutely blew my mind. This is about seven years ago, I did my first talk here in Orlando on, on the microbiome, and we've learned so much since then. Um, you know, and to know that there's uh, as many as 40 to 100 trillion 
uh, types of um, uh, bacteria cells in our body, 400 to 1,000 different species. Okay, so there's lots of biodiversity. Viruses, 380 trillion inside of our bodies right now. Okay, so many of them are beneficial. There's parasites and fungi. And for those who are interested in, in uh, uh, mushrooms and mycelium, we have that type of network also inside of us. Most of these microbes are good, okay? Don't be so fearful about it because the thing is, is that you have just as many uh, microorganism cells in your body as your own human cells, okay? In fact, some estimates say there's more. Some estimates say you're more microbe than a human in terms of cells. They're much smaller than your human cells, but they're still there. So only about 1% are, are considered bad, but they're mostly bad only under certain conditions where maybe there's just too many of them. Your ecosystem got thrown out of whack and now there's an explosion of the bad actors in your body. So germ theory is what I teach as a science teacher every day. I teach uh, virtually middle school uh, students all over the world. And I have in my curriculum to say that, you know, the presence of a germ is a factor of whether you get a disease or you don't get a disease. And so you can prevent it or kill it um, by, you know, like a vaccine or, you know, certain uh, sprays and pasteurization and so on. Okay. And, and in many cases um, for food preparation and in medical world, sterilization, that is true. There are some bad uh, uh, microorganisms and they can and, and will cause disease. But then there's also the terrain theory, which takes this a little further. And this is what I like the most. And this is, this is how it works even in our food forests is that um, there is a whole biodiversity of microorganisms and plants and animals and so on. And it's about having an abundance of the good guys just limiting the ones that could potentially become bad, okay? And in our body, a lot of the free-floating microbes are perfectly harmless, the E. coli, staph, um, a lot of these are harmless when they're just floating by themselves. It's when they come together and they form these little terrorist cells called biofilms that they start to release chemicals that are completely different than what they can release by themselves. And um, that's when things get bad. Lyme disease is a biofilm uh, disease. Okay. And these biofilms are resistant to most antibiotics, which makes them really hard to fight unless you use the right herbs. And uh, there's ways through herbal treatments that you can bust them up, break up those biofilms. So just the idea that we are loaded with microbes and most of them are beneficial and they call them germs, but don't be afraid of these germs because most of them are good for you. There's just certain things you can do to, to keep the bad ones in balance. Now, here's the biggie here. This we just realized over the past few years is that we actually have an inner food forest with trees or plants, however you want to call them, growing in our gut lining. We literally have a food forest growing inside of our bodies, okay? Um, this is a protein trunk that you see there followed by little branches of complex sugars. And we have bacteria like Acromantia mucinophilia that specifically eat these branches and they poop out butyrate, which is like a fertilizer for your gut. Uh, about 90% of the energy that your gut lining needs, your cells need come from the butyrate that's made by microbes. So that's how they get it. That's how they get it. And then they use that fertilizer to make more trees. Okay. Healthy people have a lush, beautiful food forest in their gut. And these trees not only feed a lot of your microbes, but they also make it very difficult for microbes to form those biofilms and for viruses to get past all these branches and actually penetrate your gut lining and get into your bloodstream. So we want to build that uh, food forest. And the best way to do it is have those healthy microbes in you and then also feed it more food from your diet. So if you give them the food forest here, and then you give them food from your diet, lots of fibers and plant materials, then you're going to have a healthy ecosystem inside of you. And here's the microscopic view, the blue, they just use special um, compounds to light these up 
that's your cell one th one one cell thick is your gut lining okay which is your um esophagus stomach small intestine large intestine and so on it's only one cell thick and that's how the nutrients they get through and that's how pathogens get through like viruses and bacteria into your bloodstream you want to have a very thick food forest to make it hard for them to get through. So that green right there is the mucus layer. If you reach inside your mouth right now, you feel that? That's your mucus layer. And from your mouth to your anus, you have that. And um, there's little mucins, little trees inside of that. And uh, you, you can't feel them because they're so microscopic, but they're there and you have microbes in your mouth right now munching away at it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in, in uh, 1990, the National Institute of Health, they began the Human Genome Project. And what they did is they set out to discover a gene for like every disease that we have. They wanted to map the genome and know all the genes that are inside of us. Okay, um, in 2003, the map was complete. And we realized that 99.9% .9 of your DNA is the same as the person right next to you. So I was like, oh man, well, okay, that's interesting. And some of the, the point one is just some of the little differences in your looks and so on. Um, and we also didn't find a gene for cancer, or obesity, or diabetes. We can't just fix that gene and turn it off. Okay, we can't. But also we are very surprised to find out that we only have a little over 20,000 genes. An earthworm has twice the amount of genes that we have. A water flea has more. A rice plant has almost like twice the amount that we have. So we're not really that sophisticated as far as human DNA goes. So how is it that we are so advanced? Well, it turns out that in 2007, the National Institute of Health, they did another mapping, and that's the microbiome that's inside of our gut. And what they found is that we have three and a half million unique functional genes that operate inside of our, our body uh, from the microbes. It's their... Uh, genetic information. So let this sink in for a moment. In terms of genetic makeup, humans are more than 99% microbial. Okay, 1% of our genetic intelligence is actually inside our own cells and our own DNA. So look, genes are like recipes, okay? They make hormones, they make neurotransmitters, they make all sorts of signals that communicate with your body. The vast majority of chemicals that are circulating in your blood right now are dependent upon bacterial genes for their synthesis. Okay, so these signaling molecules, these hormones, neurotransmitters, vitamins, and so on, they are the language of the microbes. They speak to other microbes. They actually speak to our immune system. They have conversations with your brain. And every single organ in your body has receptors to the chemicals that they make. So we were built and designed to communicate with the products of microbes. Okay, so just think about this for a moment. Um, we need our oxygen from trees and bacteria. We need minerals from rocks, right? We need our water from rivers and streams. And the chemical communication system that was put into our body is largely the intelligence of nature, of these microbes. And so without them orchestrating our genes and signaling pathways in our body, um, we lose a huge chunk of the communication network and much of our intelligence, our body's own innate intelligence is lost. And so when you look pound for pound, there's more microbes uh, in our, as far as weight goes, there's more microbial weight than the weight of your human brain. And so these are all the roles, many of the roles of the microbiome and a large amount of it has to do with the communication with the body. Okay, sending signals to suppress tumors and inflammation, um, synthesizing vitamins. When you go to the store and you buy B12, that's the product of microbes. Okay, if you eat food that has, has B12 in it, that's because its gut bacteria made that B12 and now you're eating it. And so some vitamins are like folate and biotin and so on. They are the product of microbes. There's just no other way that a lot of them are made. Okay, so they can regulate your mood. They can activate detoxification and antioxidant pathways, which is so important. So my question to you guys is like, where do we get these microbes? How, how do we get them inside of our body? Um, one of the main ways is the mother's uh, birth canal. 
um, three quarters of your microbiome is traced back to your mother. And so if you were C-section or bottle fed with formula, you start off with um, like one arm behind your back, okay? Because um, that's where you download your antivirus software. If you're a computer, it's, it's right. You, you need your protection against disease. Um, it's so calibrated that when a baby has any type of illness, its saliva goes a little bit into the breast. It calibrates what type of microbes that it needs to, um, or sugars it needs to make to feed the certain microbes that make the certain medicine to help fight that disease. And then it comes out through the milk and feeds the baby. So it's, it's so intelligent and um, uh, mothers and females, you are amazing. The amount of intelligence in your body just blows me away. And so, um, you know, when I had my recent, my twins recently, we, it was a natural birth, but we also had um, some Q-tips and things to actually seed the vaginal fluids to seed the babies with it if they were born through C-section, but we didn't have to do that. Um, but thankfully, um, they were born naturally and drank breast milk. And I even have uh, microscopic images of the breast milk under a microscope with the bacteria and everything that I'll have to show you guys sometime. Um, it's very interesting. So eating fruits and veggies and fermented foods is a great way as well. Inhaling microbes, we inhale about a million microbes a day into our bodies, representing over almost uh, 750 or so different species, and then also supplements like probiotics. And so you're ingesting microbes every day through the food that you eat and so on. So if you're thinking about probiotics, they're good, but you're getting so many microbes in your body. It's amazing. Um, so, you know, what happened though? Like, there's so much disease that we have right now in the Western world. And we know how important the microbiome is. So we should be like doing everything that's possible to protect them and to feed them and nourish them and make sure that they're doing everything that they need to keep us healthy. But when we look at the Western diet, and we look at our gut microbes, we see that there's a huge loss of species biodiversity. Just like Terry's talking about with the outside world, there's a huge loss of biodiversity in the diet of um, Westerners. They, they, they did a study in 2017 of uh, 17 Western nations, and they took 350 stool samples, almost one a day, from the Hazda people who live in Africa. They're one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer tribes and they took their fecal analysis. And right now what we can do, and I, I actually did my recent one and I have the results coming out soon from Biome, is you can send a fecal uh, sample and have your microbiome mapped. They could see exactly what species are in there, um, the metabolites that they're producing, the levels of them to see if they're making a lot of good stuff or bad stuff. And they can do this, but it, it changes daily with stress levels, diet, all that and everything. So that's why they did 350. And they monitored it over time. And look on the left here, the Hazda tribe and the Malawi tribe, largely hunter-gatherer tribes, look at the diversity that's in their gut. Every one of these here is a, a different species of um, bacteria. And then on the right, you can see that there were many species that are either no longer there, or just not there at all. So there's something wrong. The biodiversity in the gut is as diverse as the diets and the landscape of the people who live in it. The Hazda tribe has about double the gut microbes of those living in the Western culture. And so the conclusion is, is that the reduced diversity in our gut is a result of modern culture and it's weakening our immune defenses and our ability to, to fight off disease. And so they also noticed that the Hazda tribe eat about 100 to 150 grams of fiber every day compared to the Western diet, which is about 15 grams. And so the recommended is only 20 to 30. Now, if you go out there and you eat 100 grams of fiber after this talk, because you watch this and you're like, I wanna be like the Hazda tribe, um, you're gonna be on the toilet all day, <laughs> okay? You gotta work up with this. You gotta work up to it and um, it takes some time. And I'm not saying I want you to do 100, 150 a day, but having more fiber in your gut is going to encourage and bring in and let all the good guys kind of stay there. Okay, so that's really, really important um, to, to understand. All right, so I'm looking at some questions here. 
And um, I would love to show you that, Leanne, is that the microscopic breast milk. You see a lot of fat globules in there and then some microbes. And so what interferes with this balance? Like, why is our ecosystem losing the diversity over time? Well, a large part of it has to do with your diet, okay? Are you getting enough fiber? Let me just put it plain and simple. You want to be eating a diversity of plant uh, materials as well as plenty of fiber. And um, uh, environmental toxins also play a huge role into affecting the gut. So here's the deal. Glyphosate, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, is an antibiotic. And it's sprayed on our food if you're not eating organic food and it gets into your body. So um, it's not beneficial. Your oral health can affect your health too. Are you brushing your teeth? Are you taking care of your teeth? Because if you don't, these, le these gums become leaky and the bacteria get in there and they can actually go to your heart. Okay, so heart disease is largely connected to the oral microbes in your mouth because they're finding the pathogenic microbes in the heart of people with heart disease are almost exactly the same as to the ones that are in uh, someone who has uh, gingivitis or, you know, some kind of uh, eroding of, of the, the mucus layers in the, the layers of your gums. Okay, antibiotics are a big one in pharmaceuticals, um, birth control pills, unfortunately, <laughs> and uh, proton uh, pump inhibitors for acid levels, um, and even like uh, acetaminophen and, and other drugs can affect the microbiome in a major way. Um, same with processed foods as well is a major one, especially we have foods that have preservatives. What are preservatives? They're basically antimicrobial agents, okay? And so we have an ecosystem collapse happening inside of our bodies. Um, over 800 antibiotics prescribed for every 1,000 Americans and 80% of the antibiotics that are produced in our country are given to our factory farm system for those animals. Okay, so 8 million pounds of prescription antibiotics every year. We are doing nothing less than like a, a nuclear bomb on our microbiome, the 99% of our intelligence that exists in our body. And glyphosate, the use of it, it's a main ingredient to Roundup and Roundup the weed killer. Um, glyphosate was originally patented as a, um, a drain cleaner because it binds to minerals so well and helps clear out the calcium and iron and all that kind of stuff. So imagine what it can do in your body and also in your soil. It, it, it binds it and it holds on to those trace minerals and makes it hard for you to absorb. The second thing, and I have it in my document that I attached earlier, the patent. It is a patented mic antimicrobial agent, okay? It's basically a, um, an antibiotic. And so uh, if you eat wheat, or, or oats that are non-GMO, and it'll say it on the label, and it's not organic, they spray the wheat and the oats in order to dry it better and to get it nice and dry off of the field, especially in wet regions. And then they make it into crackers and then they make it into your Cheerios and so on. So that's why here in one of the tests here, about 10 parts per billion to maybe 70 or so is, is um maybe our health, not healthy range, but just like tolerable. Look at the levels here, over a thousand parts per billion in Cheerios. Even Annie's, um, the non-organic, uh, the cookies, uh, 55, and uh, hummus, non-organic hummus that just came out loaded with, with glyphosate. Um, so you have to be very careful about if you're eating anything from wheat or barley or corn or anything like Anything that's non-organic, you're getting these low doses of microantibiotics in your body every day. And so what we're learning is that this hygiene hypothesis, this idea that um, we're making ourselves too clean, we're wiping out all these germs that we thought were, were all bad, and now we don't have the communication network with our immune system that we had. Okay, so... Um, you know, our microbes in our body actually put our immune system through training camp. You know, they're cells, single cells, training single cells. Uh, healthy bacteria know about bad bacteria. And they're training our killer T cells and all their cells to, to learn how to fight off infection. I mean, that is just amazing of that communication. 70% of your immune system is wrapped around your gut. And so your gut microbes are right there talking back and forth between your gut lining 
they're just on the other side of that wall. They're the, the immune system. So they're always talking and communicating and I'm sure they're sharing stories. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, is that there's many diseases associated to the gut dysbiosis, which is the ecosystem, uh, not necessarily full collapse. You know, people have colitis and, and uh, you know, colon cancer and so on, and practically have a full collapse of their, of their inner ecosystem. But many of these conditions are reversible and definitely fully manageable, even multiple sclerosis, which I don't have on here. Um, and some of these other are very manageable with the right uh, diets to manage the ecosystem. And it's sad to see that over half of our children in this country right now already have a chronic disease, which means they're gonna have it for life and they're gonna be put on drugs to manage it and never take it away. And that's the problem with our, our system right now. The healthcare system is just about disease management there's no effective protective or preventative strategy and no talk about the microbiome. And um, unfortunately, this is a, an epidemic and $47 trillion by 2030 to fight off chronic disease worldwide. So we need to find better solutions. We can't have people like, um, for example, uh, Karen Walker in this article here, who um, takes 18 prescription drugs a day. All, all of it is for chronic uh, conditions like pain and asthma and fibromyalgia, all these things that are tied to unhealthy gut microbiome. And um, they're on it for life. Okay, they're on these drugs for life unless they figure out like a better way of, of dealing with it. We need to learn about restoring the balance through proper nutrition, uh, stress management, exercise, and so on. Um, Laura, you ask a great question. Doesn't soil health affect the impact of the quality of what we ingest? Um, yes, I am a soil advocate for Kiss the Ground. I highly recommend their advocate course that they're about to take. I could give you a link and, and possibly I'm not, maybe there might be a discount for that. I could probably post in the, in the chat um, later in Facebook. But um, if you have healthy microbiome in the soil, that's the gut of the plant. That's where all the digestion of the plant takes place, right? It's the microbes that make the nutrients available to the plant. And so when it has those microbes, it's able to um, you know, have a lot more uh, vitamins and minerals inside of it. And the only way minerals come from your rocks is acids released by microbes, um, breaking it down into small digestible pieces. So it gets in the plant and then the plant's able to protect itself, okay? And I'll say one more thing about plants in a moment, just hold that thought. But what happens is when we digest our food, this is just a tube. This is still the outside world, right? This food was just outside, the microbes were just outside and it travels through you. If you're lucky, if you chew enough and you have the right amount of stomach acids, especially if you're older, you might, um, be low on acids. So that's why I recommend like some kind of digestive enzyme um, here or uh, HCL with pepsin, which, oh my gosh, it's upside down or reverse. But anyways, um, they help break down your food. Okay. And so the food gets absorbed through the gut lining. It's kind of like cheesecloth, right? If you're herbalists or anyone who does kitchen, like you're a cook, and you use cheesecloth to wring out things, only the small stuff gets through the cheesecloth. Everything else doesn't. <laughs> and that's your intestines. They're like cheesecloth. And so you gotta break that stuff down with mechanical, like chewing and, and moving with the muscles or with acids. And um, so that's how your nutrients get absorbed is you break them down and it goes through your small intestines, your bloodstream. Now, what's left is goes into your large intestine, the colon. And we mostly thought for years, and I still have it in my curriculum to teach kids, is that's where your poop is formed and that's where you know, water is absorbed and that's about it, okay? But this is the focus of today. This is the focus of today. This is your rainforest. This is where most of the microbes are. In fact, this is the most microbial dense habitat on the planet is um, the rainforest in your large intestine. That's where it breaks down the fibers, resistant starches, and the phytochemicals that we're going to um, talk about. And even some meat, like if you don't digest your meat really well or eat too much when you eat it, it'll ferment and make some uh, irritating 
molecules that could lead to colon cancer if you're if you're not combining it or just limiting it and eating a lot of plant materials and stuff to help fight off the things they make. So you've got to be careful with eating a, a meal that's like just meat and nothing else um, and not chewing very well because that would be really bad for you. Um, I don't want to go into this too much, but the thing is, is that if you can see here on the left, there's that blue, blue stuff. That's the mucus. And those little trees are the mucins. So as you eat a lot of fiber and plant molecules, what are called polyphenols, um, it will make that, that mucus lining really thick and it makes it very difficult for pathogens to get in. And then you have these tight junctions that hold, hold the, your gut lining together close together, okay, your intestines, all of that, that's just one cell thick. And that lining has these little things called tight junctions that keep them close together. And nutrients go through them. It's kind of like a Panama Canal. One gate opens, another one goes in and so on. But if you have a lot of antibiotics or gluten, glyphosate, stress, and toxins, they can work at these junctions and loosen them. And so what happens is pathogens can get through and also large food particles that normally would never get through your gut because of that cheesecloth is too, too small, they get through there too. Your immune system does not understand what they are and starts attacking them and you start to get food sensitivities and food allergies. So we're learning that this is uh, the leaky gut as we call it, these loose junctions and gluten can do it within five minutes. But if you're really healthy, um, a lot of times you can help restore it and it's constantly getting broken and then restored and broken and then restored. But if you're not eating a proper diet and not getting the right things or exercising and, and, um, take, and getting rid of the toxins and you have a lot of toxins coming in from non-organic foods and, and your uh, perfumes and hygiene products that you're rubbing on your skin that have all these toxins, um, that gets into your body and that can loosen up the gut. And so some people take gluten and they're like, I'm perfectly fine. But the thing is, is that it's, it's a whole range of things that can make the leaky gut uh, worse and persistent. Okay, so by eating uh, resistant starches from your green bananas, I make green banana flour from my trees, um, cassava, yam, ube yams. These guys are great with resistant starches. You guys grow these in your food forest. And the biodiverse salads um, that we're going to show you in a moment. Um, organic toxin-free lifestyle, sleep, exercise, and low stress. Okay, stress can affect your gut as well, unfortunately, because I had a lot of stress over the past year with giving birth to twins. Well, I didn't give birth to twins, but my partner did. And so, you know, it can be stressful and amazing at the same time, but you got to try to figure out ways to manage that. So those are the things that can take an ecosystem that's out of balance, as you see on the left, to one that's balanced. So let's look at our plants. They have these compounds called polyphenols. They can do amazing things for your body, um, including uh, helping to treat inflammation and heart disease and, and uh, digestive issues. But look at the size of these molecules. If you're a chemistry person or, or took chemistry in school and you look at these, you're like, my gosh, they're so big. Can they get through my small intestine? The answer is no. They can't. So they talk all about flavonoids and resveratrol and lycopene and your, and your tomatoes and all that. These plant molecules are 95% indigestible by your body. And so the medicine is there, but it just keeps going through you if you don't have the microbes to break it down. So it's the microbes that turn these things into magic, okay? They break down these polyphenols and they turn it into vitamins and hormones and neurotransmitters. So there's like over 8,000 polyphenols and they're largely in your um, plant uh, food products. And they can change the composition and biodiversity they got just by ingesting them and having your microbes break them down and turning them into health promoting compounds. And so for example, um, they can turn these polyphenols that are in your plants into vitamin B12, K2, which gets calcium in your bones, folate, um, biotin, butyrate, which is your main food source for your gut, um, hormones, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, as well as antimicrobial compounds that can limit the pathogens. They, will, they won't hurt the good guys, only the bad guys. 
That's how herbal medicine works. That's how I can ferment with garlic in my ferments and still ferment is the fact that the antimicrobial uh, herbs only affect the bad guys and not the good guys. They feed the good guys actually. And so for example, quercetin that's in your um, elderberries and your sweet potato leaves and so on makes butyrate, which will repair your gut. And um, quercetin also can detox you from glyphosate, okay? That's why I even take some uh, quercetin supplement as well to help fight, especially if I go out to eat somewhere um, and it's not organic. All right, so um, it can also make anti microbial protein, so limit the bad guys, and um, eat your blueberries, and the enzymes will turn it into stuff that promotes and feeds the good guys, and then also um, can block pathogens from being able to get into your lining and, and penetrate. And what we just learned over the past year is that by feeding yourself tryptophan, and um, yes, meats have it, but so do seeds and nuts and so on, um, it'll feed a microbe that makes short chain fatty acids, which signals your gut to release serotonin. 95% of your body's serotonin is produced by the microbes that get the signal from the food that you eat and makes a happy brain. So um, your gut speaks to your brain. There's actually more nerve fibers that go from the bottom up to the top down. And so that's why they call it the second brain. It's loaded with nerve fibers and pathways that send neurotransmitters up to your brain and make you feel happy. So if you have depression, anxiety, and you don't have any reason for it, like you didn't recently get dumped or lose a job or whatever, then you know, look into your microbiome and see if there's a way that maybe you can help um, restore your mood. And one of the problems, and this is why we're about to make this salad and show you how to make the salad. One of the problems with our food industry today is that we're selectively breeding plants to be less bitter. And so a lot of our polyphenols are what we call bitters. In the herbal world, we call them bitters. And they're not all bitter because some are spices like uh, uh, cloves and um, gingers and turmeric, which I don't think are too bitter. So basically, uh, the food industry routinely removes a lot of these compounds and um, the foods taste more mild or more sweet and we like them, but we're taking away the plant uh, chem chemicals that make us healthy. So going back to, was it Annabelle or um, uh, who was talking about the plants and healthy soil? Well, if you have really healthy soil, when the plants undergo stress, they can make secondary metabolites, which protect them against UV light, um, against pests being able to eat them and like crunch through the cells and, and eat and get and suck up the sap. Um, it protects them against the harsh changes in the climate. And these are protective compounds. You make melanin, right? You synthesize melanin. That's a secondary metabolite that protects you against UV radiation. And so these plant protective compounds that they, that they create when they're under stress, micro stresses, is what, um, when we eat them, protect us against stress. So it's crazy to think about the fact that if I drink a few, gla a few cups of green tea that has these polyphenols that the stuff that's in the polyphenol that protects the green tea against UV radiation, if I eat that stuff, I will be more or less likely to get a sunburn. Okay, you can actually eat sun, sunscreen by getting more of these polyphenols in your body. And, and I definitely want to talk more about that process of micro stressors and, and immune health in the future. But that's a completely different talk. And, and when I go into Home Depot and uh, I go into Lowe's and so on, I see these weed control. If you look at that label and you see the plantain and the chickweed and all the stuff that it kills, if you want to know the best plants to eat for your health that have the highest amount of these bitters and polyphenols that feed your microbiome that'll make you healthy, just look at that package. Write down what's on that weed killer. The... the um, what is it? The money wart or the, um, the penny wart, uh, all that stuff. Write it down. Dandelion leaf. Um, write it down and grow that stuff or, or get that herb and put it in your diet because we are removing the most nutritious and medicinal plants on the planet um, with our weed killers. And the people who are doing it often have chronic conditions. Okay. And they're replacing it with their grass lawns. 
And so I comb through a lot of research and I try to look for some of the top tropical polyphenol plants. This was on the list. Some of them surprised me. Curry leaf was way on top. For spices, clove was like number one. Katuk was on there. Uh, Piper Lala um, was on there. Moringa was on there. Vietnamese coriander, Thai basil, Rizel. This is the stuff that we grow in our food forest. Like that, the top 10 list. Uh, I also had stink bean, but I don't eat that. But stink bean was like number one. But they're loaded with antioxidants and polyphenols. Like polyphenols are low, largely have antioxidant properties. So why you want to be growing these plants in your food forest and adding them to your diet is that they're less cultivated. So they have more of the plant protective properties. They're higher in fiber, right? We want to be like the haas of the people. Um, more biodiverse microbes live on the veggies that you harvest at home. So if you have a whole variety of plants that you eat from your garden, you're going to have a whole variety of plant compounds. Your microbes are just like you and me. We have our own preferences for food. So some like one compound, some like the other. So by um, having a, micro, a diverse microbiome, diverse plants, you're going to have diverse metabolites and symbols, signals that will help keep you healthy. And so resistant starches, your green banana, cassava, and your ube yam, your polyphenols and all of these colorful garden greens and your plant fibers from your root tubers are just really what you want. And I have a little video that I'm going to show you just quick to show a lot of the plants that I use for my biodiversity salad. And so I'm going to stop sharing this and share my video very quickly here and sit back and enjoy. This is just two minutes long. And see if I can turn off. Okay. All right, so, oh man, does that salad look amazing? <laughs> and so uh, I, add, I added some other stuff on top too. And so there's some ferments. This is my papaya cheese. So I take um, green papaya with carrots and I will have this recipe on my social media um, within the next few days and the video on how to make it. Um, and that has a lot of enzymes that help digest uh, meats and other proteins and so on. And it also has... Uh, it's a prebiotic. It's an amazing prebiotic for your body um, and reduce inflammation. So um, nuts and seeds are also great. And those will help, you know, produce the serotonin in our body and uh, sprouts. My gosh, sprouts are filled with the, um, the trace minerals and the enzymes needed for our microbes to do what they do best. 
And um, so get some healthy fats with a little olive oil dribbled on top or, or avocado oil. And it's just absolutely amazing. And there's not one plant that I didn't use for my food for, or, or from a garden bed. I didn't use any plants from a garden bed. Now I could, arugula is a great bitter. Um, and uh, there are some other ones that are really good that you can grow in your, in your annual garden beds, but cilantro as well. But um, I just chose this and it was so delicious. And everyone was basically a perennial plant. Okay. And so when you have that diversity from the outside, like I can't find those things in the store, those plants in the store, I need to grow a garden to do it. And the studies are just coming out. There's over 50,000 uh, research papers on the microbiome in the past five years alone. Okay. This is where medicine is going in the direction of, of health. So if you are a doctor or your nurse or anything, you better learn about this because um, this is so important. And one of the articles that I have in my source that I, I gave to you and attached is an article that just came out, I think in February from a Harvard, I believe it was a Harvard uh, a doctor. And he's, he is convinced that most uh, chronic illness comes from the leaky gut, which I just showed you. And, and, and to prevent that leakiness, one of the top things is to eat these fibers and these polyphenols that will thicken the gut and improve your integrity of that gut and keep the bad guys out and, and prevent you know, food uh, sensitivities and so on. And so we have the research here that shows increasing microbial diversity and composition versus rural and urban environments. The ones on the left, I know those names of the bacteria seem like fecal bacterium, doesn't sound good, but it's actually a beneficial one. And um, the ones on the left, the, when they did the gut studies, when they took that, the gut testing analysis of these people, they found that there were more beneficial strains and a higher abundance of those strains in those who are surrounded with uh, trees and vegetation versus those who are in a sterile environment. The ones on the right, like Clostridium, can be Clostridium difficile can be one of the worst um, uh, illnesses for people, bacterial illnesses. It can cause diarrhea to die. And so um, these numbers are higher in those living in sterile urban environments. So the data is out there. And Shinrin Yoku, okay, um, forest bathing. Shinrin means forest, Yoku means bathing. You're literally bathing in essential oils, in microbes when you go out into the forest, and the essential oils from the trees that are released, the pinenes and, and uh, lemonines and so on that are coming out of your pine needles. Get some pine needles from your uh, longleaf pine and, and simmer it in, in water for 20 minutes, drink that tea. You know, you're gonna get these essential oils that way as well. Hug a tree, right? You hug a tree, touch those microbes and get uh, bathe in that because it's going to help fight um, cancer cells, your killer cells that fight off uh, cancer and pathogens actually increase in the study here that you see on the left. The forest bather who goes out in the forest and, and um, interacts with nature for 30 days afterwards, the killer, the natural killer cell activity is higher in their bodies versus a city tourist, okay? And so, um, you know, you're seeing here that um, uh, taking in the forest with all the senses is going to help you, like balance yourself with the ecosystem. Let the outside flow through you because you're taking in the biodiversity from around you. And one of the best things you could do at home is to create that biodiversity. Turn your, your lawns into a biodiverse food forest. It's not just diversity with plants, it's also diversity of microbes. And you're taking them inside of you, they're flowing through you every day. Your outside equals your inside. If you can't be a health nut and live in a sterile environment and just take protein shakes and work out all the time, you have to go out into nature and enjoy it because um, the microbiome is so important. That's the only way you get the microbiome into your body is from what you ingest and what you breathe. Okay, so understand that. And the same way that we have in the food forest, the same with the gut. Look on the left, leaky gut, pathogens are getting through. Our compost is really low, right? Look on the right, that thick soil organic matter, that thickness of... of biodiversity and life is so thick on the right that nothing's going to get through that barrier. And you're constantly feeding those little food forest trees that are in your gut. The inner terrain is looking good. And look at all that, the products of these little livestock in here, the butyrate, which feeds your gut and helps reduce um, 
uh, fat, uh, meta uh, increased fat metabolism, serotonin, folate, and so on. It's amazing. If you want to test your gut, I just took Viome test, um, which is about like 180 bucks. Um, I don't have the results yet. I was hoping to get them, but they're a little delayed right now. But it'll show you the biodiversity in your gut. It's going to compare your results with everyone else that have, they have tested. It's going to show you many things like um, <clears throat> it's going to show you the pathogenic bacteria that are present, the good ones that are present. It's going to um, give you an idea of, of uh, the metabolites that are produced by the bacteria. Like we produce good ones and then the pathogens make bad ones. So if you have high levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide and putrescine and so on, then that means that there's probably something going on that's wrong in your gut. And so they also recommend a diet plan, like foods that you can eat to help restore that gut balance. And then you can get tested later, maybe like next year or whatever, and then see how your ecosystem is doing. Because we can't see it directly, but there's ways that we can look at it indirectly. And we don't know what a perfect gut actually looks like or what perfect species are there, but we're getting close. We're getting close and it's going to change and it's going to be a complete revolution in medicine and healthcare. And um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about that for you, with you. Okay. And so um, it looks like we're over on time, but here's oh, just a quick summary. And I don't know if you have an extra minute or two, if you want to ask a question, but otherwise, uh, Terry, go ahead and, and take oh, it away. Well, Jeff, you're, you, you have a gift of making this minuscule part of life interesting. And if you, <laughs> I, anyone would have told me that you could keep my attention on talking about the gut biome for an hour, I wouldn't have believed you. But I, after hearing your talk, I actually co started composting differently. Much like you wouldn't just throw like a potato or a carrot right on your garden bed trying to fertilize it. It's that same thing in the colon. You need that microorganisms to break down. And then when you can start seeing the, the comparison between our gardens and our bodies and even our rivers, and you start looking at why our rivers are sick, we can see why our bodies are sick. And you really helped tie these things together for me. So thank you for making it so interesting and so digestible, pardon the pun. And uh, please You're tell welcome. us where we can reach you and how we can contact you and how we can learn more. All right, great. Um... I will just show this quickly, and here's some sources for you. These are also in that document that I've provided for you, and these are some good sources to help you with understanding how to like restore that gut microbiome and forest bathing. I love Dr. Kingley. He's, he's so amazing. Um, you can find me, social media, uh, Nature Hackers, my Instagram, as well as my YouTube. I have a lot more videos I plan on putting out. And oh, on this topic that I've been working on and already have, I just got to put it out there. Um, you can also contact me at this email if you want me to do a talk on any specific part of that and expand it. I have a lot of things to discuss as well, especially relationship to, to the immune system and, and all that. But um, please reach out. I'm available and, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. And we're going to be taking all the questions that came in the chat and posting them on our community uh, page, the Sustainable Kashi Community Group page. Um, it'd be a great way for us to answer each of the questions in more detail. Uh, that space is for us to interact. It's a place for us to meet and uh, go and help each other, whether it's about gardening, whether it's about your gut biome, or uh, any aspect of perma permaculture or community. So please join us over there, and we'll continue this conversation. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you got anything out of the group, we have a donations page that uh, Amy will put on the on the chat. Thank you, Amy, for all your hard work. She's uh, busy in the background, keeping everything moving. Um, and all these videos will be uploaded on uh, YouTube so you can watch them later. Uh, next week, we have Shanti Pierce, who is going to be talking to us about bamboo. And uh, she is an amazing presenter, and she lives and breathes bamboo. So if you've ever wanted to incorporate bamboo deeper into your project, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, week to, to join us. We're all in this soup together. Um, amazingly interconnected, uh, perfectly dependent on each other, and uh, for our very survival. And uh, bio biologically, culturally, Globally, we're all connected to every single other thing on the planet. And the coronavirus has 
kind of put us all into a global timeout and given us time to think about every part of the system and how our actions affect each other. So let's take that time and make a difference. So thank you for being a part of this community and respecting every part of our beautiful ecosystem. We hope to see you all next week. Yeah.